Timeless Truths, a collection of classic sermons from Dr. Charles Stanley. Today's selection, recorded in 1999, a warning against spiritual drifting. It's a very discomforting feeling to realize that you're not where you ought to be in your relationship with the Lord and not where you want to be. But it's even more discomforting to realize that you just don't even know how you got where you are. You certainly did not make a decision to choose to disobey God, walk away from Him, and start living in sin. And so when you begin to realize that something's not right, you probably recall the past when you had peace with God and peace with yourself. When you were daily meditating upon God's Word, He was feasting your soul. When you were enjoying answers to prayer, when you were confidently sharing your faith, generously giving to the Lord's work, and serving Him joyfully. But something happened. What happened? How is it that now you could have drifted so far away? What caused that to happen? How did it happen? Why did it happen? How can you recover from all of that to get back where you ought to be? Well, that's what I want to talk about in this message, and I want to talk about a warning against spiritual drifting. And I want you to turn, if you will, to the book of Hebrews, and I want us to read just a few verses of this uh, second chapter of Hebrews, the first four verses of this chapter, which is a very clear warning from God about drifting from Him and His truth. And so he begins by saying, for this reason, which we'll explain in a moment, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, that is unchangeable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, that is a fair reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also bearing witness with them, both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to to his own will. Now, there are many, many people who used to be in church, used to have a relationship with the Lord, used to have a good relationship with Him, but today they're out of church because they're out of fellowship, out of God's will, wasting their life, their days, their months, the years of their life, trying to fill it with something or some kind of relationship to something or some person which will never be able to take the place of a personal relationship with God. Now, how did they get there? Well, that's what I want us to look at here. And I want us to look, first of all, at the very foundation of this whole idea of drifting away from God and why this warning is so very important. Now, you may be one of those persons who would have to say, well, just to be real honest, yes, I used to go to church. I used to read the Bible every day. I used to pray every day. I used to give to the Lord's work, and there was a time when I sang in the choir, taught Sunday school, ushered, worked on hospitality or something, but somewhere along the way, I just sort of got tired of that, or something happened in my life. Can't figure out what happened, but today, that's not where I am. Well, if it's not where you are, what you have to ask is where ought you to be? And so that's what I want us to consider here, and I want to ask you to be honest enough to look at yourself and to look at your life in relationship to the God who created you, and the fact that He has ordained a purpose and plan for your life, and that He's chosen to give you His best, how does that line up with the lifestyle that you're presently living? And notice what He says here. He says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. Now, there are two terms here that are, that are used in nautical ways seagoing, ships, and so forth. When he says, for example, the second one first, he says, lest we drift away. That word certainly refers to and was used of ships that would drift away from harbor or drift by their harbor. When he says, for example, we must uh, pay much closer attention to, uh, that phrase was used in terms of 
something that was anchored to a thing. And so therefore, what he's saying here is this, lest we drift away from our relationship with our Lord, unless we drift away from an intimate relationship with Him, unless we drift away from those things that we know to be true, he says we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard. Now, when I think about, I think about that, I think about uh, in uh, Proverbs 4, verse 20, what the writer of Proverbs said. He said, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all, to, listen, and health to all their whole body. Here is an admonition and here is a warning from the book of Hebrews concerning this whole idea of drifting. Now, nobody ever drifts into a holy life. No one ever drifts into sanctification. No one ever drifts into godly living. No one ever drifts into obedience to God. That is always running against the current of the world. We live in a fallen world. Everywhere you turn, there is sin and disobedience and unrighteousness and untruth and evil and wickedness and lust and all the things that go with the world system which he warns us about. Now he says, beware lest you find yourself drifting into all of that, drifting from the truth that you know. And so it's dangerous to drift. Because listen, you do not drift upstream but downstream. You never drift toward God but away from God. You never drift toward strong beliefs. You drift away from strong beliefs. This is why he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now, somebody says, well, why do you drift anyway? What, what causes people to drift? Well, more than likely, if I should say to you, why don't you come up with some reason why you have ever drifted? And more than likely, all of us could come up with something. But I want to just begin with a very basic reason people drift in their relationship with the Lord, drift away from being the persons God wants them to be, drift away from God's best in their life. Why do they do it? One, there are lots of reasons. I'm going to give you several. But number one, just simple neglect. Neglect of reading God's Word. Neglect of spending quality time in prayer with Him and neglect of corporate worship. You know what? If, you don't, if you're not spending time with Him, if you're not in His Word, I don't mean you have to have some big-time Bible study with three or four dictionaries and commentaries. And com I'm not talking about that, but at least reading God's Word and saying, Lord, speak to my heart. Lord, speak to my heart. You, do you realize this? You've got the same Holy Spirit in you that I have in me. He can teach you the truth of His Word. And so therefore, this excuse, well, you know, I just don't understand it. The only way you'll ever understand it is to get in and read it, and then God will teach you what it means. You neglect His Word. You neglect prayer. You neglect corporate worship. You, are dri you will drift away from God. He didn't, listen, He didn't give us this just for our enjoyment, but for our safety. And not, listen, not just save us once back yonder in an experience, but to save us continually from wrecking and ruining our life. He says, my word is, he says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So one of the primary reasons people drift, no time for God's word, no time for prayer, or if it's just a little bit of this or something just to sort of salve your conscience. And, uh, and so therefore, you know, just move on with life. And listen, I can, you know what I can do? Just like you can. I can stand here and sing a hymn and think about a lot of things. Never even think about the words. I can read the scripture and be thinking about something else just like you can. And isn't it true that you can be talking to God in prayer and thinking about something else? Absolutely. So when, he, when we're talking about drifting, if the only kind of praying is you're, do, you're doing is thinking about something else while you're talking to Him and reading the scripture and thinking about something else while you're reading it, and sitting here in worship and thinking, gosh, you know, I wonder what's going to happen, and not listening, you're already drifting. So we're talking about quality. We're talking about giving God your genuine attention, listening to what He has to say. God, what are you speaking? What are you saying to my heart today? Apply this to my heart, God. What do, what do you want to say to me, Lord, through all of this? Well, 
Certainly, one of the reasons is just pure neglect. The second reason is this, and there are lots of them, and that is a lack of sense of direction for your life. You know what? If you don't have a sense of direction for your life, if you're not interested in God's will for your life, you're going to drift. If you don't have a sense of direction, then, then listen, God's course for your life, His choice for your life, His purpose for your life, uh, His, His goals for your life, if they're not even meaning, meaningful enough to you to, to seek God's direction, then you're going to drift because what's life all about? If you're not on His course, in His path, you don't have a sense of direction for your life and you're just sort of living day to day, week to week, and one of these days out yonder somewhere, you're going to die and maybe go to heaven. You see, you're going to drift because you're, you're not directed toward anything. What is God's cause for your life? He has a cause for every single one of us. So one of the primary reasons is that oftentimes we lack sense of direction. Another is the influence of other people. And that is we drift. Listen, we drift because we latch on to someone or we watch someone else. And what happens is we pick up on what they say what they do. Think about all the negative things that are going on in the world. Think about all the negative talk that you hear on the radio, on the television. Negative, 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 negative. How many people are talking about God, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? If you allow yourself to listen to and be influenced by people around you, you will drift away from God by following them. They're not going to come up to say, please leave your God and follow me. No, it's that subtleness that Satan uses, things that they say. And people get involved in this, involved in that. Next thing you know, what they're involved in takes precedence over their relationship to God. The next thing you know, they're in real serious trouble. Why do people drift? Lots of reasons. One of the reasons is they're unsure about what they believe. It's the person who gets saved. Nobody ever teaches them the truth. Nobody takes time to instruct them, to disciple them. And so they come along and they get hit situations and circumstances or fall into temptation maybe over something and get into grief and, and, uh, and discouragement and guilt and don't know how to work through all that and how to get forgiveness and so forth. And they just think, well, Lord, you know, it's not working. And, and so I just might as well give up and stop praying and stop because it's not working anyway. And so because they don't understand the Scripture, don't understand what they really believe and how it works, uh, they just begin to drift away from God. Which leads me to say one of the primary reasons is that people begin to doubt God. When people begin to doubt God, they're going to start drifting. You start doubting God, next thing you're going to know, well, if you doubt Him, well, why read it when I don't understand it? And I'm not sure this is really true anyway. And I hear that there are lots of mistakes in the Bible. And so they begin to doubt what happens. They begin to drift. Well, I think one of the primary reasons people drift is this. In some area of their life, Satan finds their weakness and they begin to be tempted. And they keep on falling in the same temptation. Keep on being defeated over and over and over again, the same temptation. They finally say, you know what? Christian life's not what it's cracked up to be. It's not working. I pray and look at me now and I promised God and swore to God and, and, and told God I wasn't going to do this again. And now I've done it again. Something's wrong. So you know what? I might as well just forget it because it's just not, I'll go to church, God, and I'll pray and I'll read you a word, but Lord, it's just, I don't understand this. And so they begin to drift away from God. Next thing you know, they're not doing any of those things. Satan's found a weakness and he's hit him with it. And so there are lots of reasons people drift. And, and you probably have thought about some of those yourself. Now, here's the big question. Now, watch this carefully. How do you recover? How, how does a person restored from this drifting? Maybe you're in, you, you've gotten yourself in the biggest mess. You're so ashamed of yourself. You've got guilt and anxiety and frustration and fear. And, and you, you can tell your heart's begun to be a little hardened about things of God. And you don't like it this way. You don't want it this way. You, you want to have peace with God. You want to have peace with yourself. You want to read the Bible and understand it. You want to pray. You want to have fellowship. You want to be with God's people. Yes, 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 I do. Oh, how do I get back? Well, now remember what we said, and listen very carefully. Remember what we said, where people drift? They drift into all kinds of things. How, listen, how far can a person drift? How far can you drift? You can drift so far that God's chastising hand upon you will seem almost unbearable to bear it. Do you get that? You can drift so far that God's chastising hand can can be so painful it's almost unbearable for you. But you cannot drift so far 
that you drift beyond his love, beyond his forgiveness, and beyond his restoration. He's there waiting for you, my friend. And the only reason he sends pain and emptiness and frustration and anxiety is because he's trying to rescue you. Well, how do you get rescued? How do you get restored? How do you get back where you are? There are four simple, listen, four simple steps. I didn't say they were easy. Very essential steps to being restored. Now, what's the first one? Acknowledging that I'm on the drift. Acknowledging that I've been drifting. Confessing to God, that's what's going on in my life. Lord, as you, as you warned us here, you warned us against drifting, and God, that's what I've been doing. So you confess it. You acknowledge it. You recognize that's what I've been doing. The second step is very simple, but very important. It, listen, the acknowledgement of drifting must be followed by genuine repentance. Repentance is not just feeling sorry. Repentance is not crying. Repentance is not feeling guilty. All three of those things would be a part of it. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is a decision. Repentance is a change of mind. I don't want to continue this way. This is not God's best. This is not God's will. I, I, don't want, I, don't, I don't want this kind of life. I don't want the consequences, and I don't want to miss God's best. It is a change of mind. It is a change of mind that's going to result in a change of direction and conduct. A person cannot repent of their sin and keep on doing the same thing they're doing. They can feel sorry for it. They can confess it. They can weep. They can feel guilty. They can moan and groan and go to all kinds of revival meetings and do all kinds of things and run to counselors and tell counselors over and over and over again, oh, this is what's going on in my life, and that's not repentance. And let me make something clear. I'm all for counselors. We have a counseling ministry. I believe in that. But I want to tell you what many people do. Re listen. When they face what's going on in their life, rather than repent of their sin, you know what they do? They want to go talk to a counselor because it makes them feel good to talk about it. Now, if it's a very perceptive counselor, they'll be able to discern this rather quickly. You just want to come back and dump your garbage today and tomorrow, and next week, next month, next year. And people go to counselors for years and years and years, the same counselor. How much garbage is there? You know what the problem is? Refuse to repent. So most of them want to go to a counselor and say, oh, yes, poor you, poor little thing, that's right. Yes, that's right. When the truth is they need to genuinely repent of their sin, have a change of mind and turn about and move in the right relationship. So step number one, acknowledge it. Recognize it's true, confess it. Step number two, genuine repentance. Change your mind. Listen, decision to change, to change the way I'm going, change the way I'm living. And number three, return to a life of submission to the will and purpose of God for your life. Return to a life of submission to the will and purpose of God for your life. If you don't go back to a submissive life before our God, you, you haven't genuinely repented. Repentance is going to lead you to a life of submission to God. Genuinely return. God, I choose, I choose to walk in obedience to you. Choose to walk in obedience to you. And what's the fourth step? Simply this. You make a decision to readjust the priorities of your life. And the priority of your life is your personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so what's the priority? I'm going to make Bible reading and Bible study, meditation upon God's Word, the priority of my life every day. I'm going to spend time with him, quality time, sharing my heart and talking to him and getting to know him better again. I'm going to meet with God's people and fellowship and worship with them. You see, it's a change of priority. No matter how far you've drifted, what you've drifted into, there's a loving father willing to rescue you, willing to draw you back. But it takes your acknowledgement, confession, repentance, and submissive will, and a change of your lifestyle in order to be recovered and to remain there. Now, everything I have said is an explanation in lots of different ways and illustrations of one simple sentence. Listen to what he said. 
You want to deal with this drifting business? We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Just that simple. Now, I don't know where you are in your life, but I know this. I know you can be where God wants you to be if you're willing to make a decision. Now, listen carefully. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're already drifting. You're off course. You, you, you don't have the compass. In other words, if you, you, you may own a Bible, but you've laid the compass aside. You're already drifting. You will drift into hurt, pain, suffering, heartache, hardship. Ultimately, without Christ, because you have made a decision that you're going to have it your way, one of these ways, listen, one of these days, you will drift into death and an eternal future for which you will spend eternity being sorry. Don't know when you're going to die. No one knows that. And that is a decision that God makes. If you let your life drift up to that moment, and you move into eternity without Christ, my friends, you will be eternally separated from everything, eternally separated from everything that is good, that you wanted in life, that you wished for, that you tried, that you tried to squeeze out of this life far more than you and I could explain. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you, listen, you are floating in a dangerous river every day. You may have lots of money, lots of friends, lots of this, good health, and all the rest. But remember, God does not sit idly, idly by and watch people rebel against Him, disobey Him without consequences. And this whole book from Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation, here's what it says. One of the things it says is this, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. What you sow, more than you sow, later than you sow. He says, every single sin, transgression and disobedience will receive a just, fair reward. It is spiritual suicide to live your life and disobey and rebel against Almighty God. I want to encourage you to ask, you to ask God to forgive you of your sins. Ask Him to cleanse your heart. And tell him you want to get on his course, in his path. You want his word to become the compass of your life. You, you don't want to miss anything else good God's got for you. You want to change. You want genuine repentance today, a decision, a change in lifestyle. God will change that the moment you're willing to say to him, trusting you as my Savior, I want your best for my life. Everybody knows where they are. No, no, they don't. Everybody doesn't know where they are. You see, we said unintentionally, blindly, slowly, gradually, we just drift. And so I want to encourage you today, if that's been going on in your life, when you get home or where you stand or whenever it happens, remember, you acknowledge it, very important. That's where it all starts. If you will do that, genuinely repent of it, submit yourself to Him, change your lifestyle, your schedule, your priorities, you're going to be back in fellowship where the loving, living God desires that you be.